Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Uh, well, good evening, everyone, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, we have a special treat with uh, Dr. Donaraj. Uh, Charles actually used to live in Indianapolis and uh, was a professor at uh, IUPUI for many years, and I got to know him working with the World Trade Club. Um, he currently now is the uh, Pinchati Endowed Chair in uh, Teaching Excellence, Professor and Chair of the Management Department at the Daniels College of Business at the University of Denver. Um, he was uh, born in India and uh, educated in Canada. He's worked in Singapore and obviously in the USA. And um, I actually have some pretty fond memories of our time uh, talking about various topics at, uh, at the World Trade Club. And so it's really a pleasure to have uh, Charles with us tonight. And with that, Charles, uh, you can take it away. You're muted. Good evening. Can you hear me? Ray? Ray, can you hear me? Good, okay. So good evening, and it's a pleasure to be here and my honor. We live in Indianapolis for 14 years. So it, uh, my two children grew up there. They went for high school and uh, my son went for Indiana University and we had wonderful time. I think 2001, I participated in the Great Decisions on the invitation of uh, Wick Childers. So I remember the topic, uh, I'm not sure what which topic it was. So that was something that I, I remember long back. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here. And I know it's a, it's a great topic to think about global supply chains and national security. And I have been in international business for the last, uh, I, I did my graduation, my PhD at uh, Western University. And as Ray mentioned, I've, uh, we grew up, I mean, I was for 26 years in India, then we left and came to Canada, lived there for seven years, went to Singapore, then came back to Canada, finished my PhD, then came to Indiana, from there to Switzerland and Switzerland to Philadelphia and now here. So one thing that has been the common thread across is the whole idea of global business. And I, I teach international business and it has been a, <clears throat> my pet team and I'm fascinated to be there. So for today, uh, for the hour, I'm looking at, okay, let's talk about global supply chain. I know uh, the COVID has really made global supply chain, supply chain as a, almost like a dinner time conversation. So I don't need to go too much in depth, but I wanted to just establish what's the relationship to do with national security. And then we look at what's the post pandemic impact. And I want to take some examples from the food industry, the automobile industry and the medical industry. And I want to end it with uh, the whole notion of digitalization. In fact, <clears throat> a lot of my current research is how does the digitalization influence globalization? And I want to end with uh, what I call globalization 4.0 where uh, the globalization is not what we used to think, and it is fundamentally uh, changing. So first of all, what is global supply chain? I think uh, the empty shelves in the, uh, in the, your, uh, what do you call a typical uh, Walmart or Target, wherever you go, and that sort of gives a good idea what supply chain is all about. I think even the kids now understand what supply chain is, right? And to some extent, um, this was something I was interested in like long time back, I was trying to uh, introduce the idea of a t-shirt, uh, what is called uh, the travels of the t-shirt. Some of you may be familiar with the work that, uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Rivoli did. And her take was, how does the travel, how does the t-shirt that you are wearing come all over the world. Like, let me, let me just share a short video and then we can go from there. America, it turns out, exports more cotton than any other country in the world. For about a century, America maintained its cotton dominance by using slave labor. Today, it does so using technology. This is a John Deere app and it shows where the pickers and tractors are. We can go into the screen on a picker 
and see what the picker driver is actually seeing on his screen. I'm sure it's, it's picking, picking the cat off the snow. So we're driving south? Yeah. Bowen Flowers is a third generation Mississippi cotton farmer. Even the seeds he uses are a feat of engineering to rival the iPhone. Most American cotton seeds are made in a lab, like this one and the Monsanto Corporation. Genes from bacteria are added to the cotton to make it more pest resistant and tolerant of herbicides. There's a debate over the safety of genetically modified crops. For American cotton farmers, though, it's mainly been settled. 20 years ago, there was no GM cotton. Today, over 90% of American cotton is genetically modified. And all this technology, the machines that automatically bale the cotton, the specially designed trucks to haul those bales away, the high-speed gins that remove those lab-designed seeds, all this technology has an impact. Since the 1950s, cotton yields have almost tripled. You've been harvesting all this cotton. How many t-shirts did you make? Oh gosh, I, I, it's, it's, it's no tell. Do, do y'all happen to know that, that answer, how many it is? We didn't know, but we went back and looked it up. The answer, from just this one farm, in just one year, there's enough cotton for nine million t-shirts. That's a t-shirt for every single person in New York City. You can see that, like the, the simple t-shirt that we talk about, it's like, I mean, think about Lubbock, Texas. Uh, I don't know if, you, if any of you have been that place. I don't know how they are able to grow cotton there, right? I mean, except for those cotton farms, nothing else grows out there, right? And but then we don't make any of the t-shirts. We just bundle it up and it goes to Shanghai and Shanghai to, it comes to the screen printers in Washington DC, gets used in New York. And finally, the used t-shirt finds its destination in Tanzania, right? And that's the type of, it's, a, it's the type of a supply chain that we are talking about. And, and for those chocolate lovers, I mean, we lived in Switzerland for four years and, uh, and I mean, I used to think before going to Switzerland, chocolates grew in Switzerland. And until I went to, uh, went to this Nestle, uh, uh, the, the exhibit center where they have this whole unit of how this, how uh, chocolate is made. And you recognize that, ah, oh, Switzerland does not grow cocoa. Actually, none of the European countries grow cocoa, right? You can see, most of the cocoa comes from Africa, Ivory Coast, the largest producer, Ghana, and, and, and then South America, right? And, and this is the supply chain that the chocolate that you all enjoy has to travel so many different countries. And in fact, there's quite a few stories about uh, the, uh, how, how cocoa is produced and, and it has been a controversial issue for quite a number of years and uh, child labor and all these things. Now it's all coming under control, okay? And you can see this is the type of supply chain that we are talking about, right? And if you think about it, like uh, until the, the World War II, we never had the ability to transport items from one, uh, one country to another in, a, in an efficient way, right? In fact, the, the, the credit goes to Malcolm McLean who came up with this idea of containerization, which fundamentally changed the efficiency of, of, uh, of any uh, intercontinental uh, shipping, right? Now, today you think about uh, the television, the, the 65 inch television that you are uh, watching on or uh, the, uh, the big TV that you have at home. And imagine that that huge TV, it takes about 15 cents, please hear me again, one five, 15 cents to transport all the way from China to here. Okay, just, just think about it. And then you think about why we are talking about all this uh, global stuff. But herein lies the controversy, right? When, when the COVID hit, 
some of you are familiar with that. And uh, let me just play a very short clip on what I call the the uh, the COVID created its own problem uh, for the containers. Let me see if we can uh, hear this. Destined for export have been piling up. Chu Hong Tao is on the move all the time. He works for Hamburg transport company Hot Road. But everything that used to be automated and run like clockwork has been thrown into chaos by the pandemic. The crisis has had far reaching effects on the logistics industry. There is a critical shortage of containers in China at present. Chu Hong Tao has to organize each one personally. Sometimes we find some containers that are being repaired. We drive there, wait for them, and then we bring them straight to our customers. There are so few containers in China right now because so many have been stranded in Europe and the U.S. Lockdowns there have brought life to a standstill. Then the order boom came. Early on when the boom started, it was especially goods related to making a home office. So office tables, office chairs, AV equipment. And the problem is growing. While China ramps up production, many other economies are in crisis mode. This factory produces machines that press metal cans. But with so little transport capacity, freight costs are exploding. I've been in China for 17 years, and I've never experienced such a strong and fast rise in transportation prices. It's taken us all by surprise. My colleagues in other companies have had the same experience. Cargo ships are also at full capacity. There's not even space for flat track goods, which are transported out in the open. The cost of a flat track from Forscher to Rotterdam used to cost about 9,500 US dollars two months ago. Today it costs around 25,000 US dollars. Every cargo ship worldwide is currently on the water, experts say. But the congestion won't be solved by more ships and containers alone. Coronavirus outbreaks among port workers, especially in the U.S., have brought logistics to a standstill in some places. The situation should improve once the coronavirus is brought under control. At some point in time in 2021, people will come to the realization there's light at the end of the tunnel. We can finally get our lives back. And when people realize that, of course, they're going to take some of that money and put it back into services as we're used to. That would be good news for the service-based economies in the U.S. and Europe. And, and that's uh, the, the biggest challenge for you. Can you imagine, like, uh, containers come, typically you bring it from all the way from Shenzhen to, uh, to perhaps to uh, Los Angeles, typical. In fact, you can bring the whole container within about six, 14 to 16 hours. And now we have the priority cl clearance and all that. And that gets from uh, Los Angeles. It comes by truck to uh, to Indianapolis and the Midwest, and then it goes on, uh, goes on to different places. Now, imagine during the COVID, we literally could not export. We literally could not get the products out. So in essence, all the containers that came in could not go back because we couldn't uh, we couldn't fill it and fill it with the type of uh, typical products that we used to send back, which is agricultural stuff. And then you add to the COVID, the, the US-China, the uh, trade war that uh, we had, all that produced. So all these disruptions fundamentally changed the notion of uh, the, 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 the consumption patterns on the, or the flow of goods. And, and you just heard about the home office uh, example. Just imagine, in an average year, in an average year, all over the United States, they will sell about one to two million home office units. Just imagine that, okay? One to two million units about a month, right? And within three months, within three months after the COVID, 50 million home offices were created. Just imagine the number of uh, laptops and the furniture and all that demand that, that spiked. And much of this demand was produced in China. And, and that's what where the the majority of the complexity came out. 
So, so fundamentally, this is the problem we are we are uh, we are countering. In fact, when we when we talk about global supply chain and security, now here is, I mean, it can be in the in the disruption in the in the supplier end, and and something doesn't come, and the producer cannot make it, or the producer gets it made, but then it cannot get to the wholesaler or distributor or retailer. Imagine during the COVID, an average uh, milk. I mean, in United States alone, I'm mean, think I'm looking at. 3.5 million gallons of milk was thrown down the drain because it could not be consumed, right? I was in Philadelphia when, in March and we just had the, in Philadelphia, uh, there is a, a, a major port that, that brings in some of the, uh, some of the uh, uh, vegetables and stuff. And for weeks, they literally had to dump the vegetables that they received, right? Because they couldn't move it on to the, to the retailer and the consumer. And then you, you have this, the other pattern of when consumers get somewhat uncertain about the supply, they start overstocking. And that's what we saw in, in the tissue paper and, and uh, washing liquid and all that stuff, okay? So uh, the point is that you, this is the, the value chain or the supply chain, anywhere in the point it can get disrupted. We saw a major play in the COVID but it can, it can happen at any time. In fact, if you go back in uh, 2016, or even all the way, go back to the 20, 2011 Thailand floods, here is one of the consulting company made an assessment. And uh, a global automaker um, typically lost about $5 billion in lost sales because of one flood in one country. Just think about it, right? And the global computer maker during this uh, US-China trade war literally lost about $1 billion market cap because uh, the, uh, they were not able to uh, get their parts in time, right? And, and not only that, they go all the way back, some of you remember the, the earthquake in Japan, and that time, I mean, the, the whole uh, units were washed out in, in, in Japan, and that sort of created this for the electronics uh, manufacturer, almost like half its uh, money gone, 56% drop in net income and 16% drop in revenue. And what's the number the number of months it took for them to recover? Like it took in the global electronics manufacturer about one year, but uh, for the global automaker, it's about six months, right? So when disruptions happen, it is not momentary, it tends to be a long lasting effect. And that one makes it uh, much more complex. And, and, and some of you uh, are in the business, uh, in the teaching and or, or in the business of uh, production and stuff. We used to pride ourselves about just-in-time manufacturing, right? Just-in-time manufacturing or, uh, I mean, in fact, we used to talk, in fact, I, I remember uh, going to Walmart and seeing how they don't even have a, a storage unit. In fact, dock-to-dock -dock, uh, transfer, in the sense the truck comes in, and straight away the items are moved in and moved straight to the shelves. And Toyota uh, used this type of a system like, you, know, you don't need to bring the parts and put it in a storage, you go, go straight to the warehouse. So most of our, the last three decades, we focused on efficiency. And efficiency was important, but then the moment there is a shock in anywhere in the supply chain, it, it, it creates a huge problem. And in fact, uh, even before COVID, you remember the Apple iPhones problem and when there was a shock in, in China. So how do we, uh, how do we think about um, uh, the impact of it? For example, in the COVID, this is uh, the trade numbers that's coming from TradeFix. Just after the COVID uh, quarter on quarter to quarter, uh, different, the drop in international, I mean, global trade. Um, in Europe, in, in Europe, it was about minus 21%, in the sense, almost one quarter of the global trade was down. And in United Kingdom, 23%. In US, it was not that bad, 16%. But in China, you, you see this number? And, and what, what you are seeing is the sudden jump in the demand that sort of got uh, the, the edge for China. So this is what happened in the, in the global supply chain. Now, what you have to recognize is a lot of our modern supply chains, they are really delicate ecosystems. They are very delicate ecosystems and they are 
well designed or optimized to function in stable conditions. Now, what happens when the conditions go murky? What happens when there is this, when there's this uh, shakeout? And that's where we are now recognizing the, the need for resilience or the need for agility, right? So once you design for just in time, you are not able to respond to the shocks. And now we are talking about, hey, you know what? We need to think in terms of just in case, just in case, right? And uh, we, we, we now increasingly are thinking about resilience, resilience and stuff. And now while you think about what does this, all this have to do with the security, national security? In fact, I thought it'd be nice for us to have an idea. How does the, uh, how do we think about security now? Oftentimes we, our, our dominant thinking in security is that military, the, the arms and then the, the uh, uh, guarding against the wars or fighting the wars. But think about it, security involves multiple dimensions. Now this is uh, a partly the, the framework on the national security uh, agenda of the United States is also built in. We are not only talking about the, uh, the military security, we are talking about economic security. We were talking about food security, we are talking about health security, personal security, community security, political security, all these are important dimensions of human security. And this is where the global supply chain uh, affects. Food security, you can see that happen. And we are going to touch on a little bit on the health, health and the other side as well, right? Now, where, what can we do? Now, much of the thinking in the business circle now is how do we build resilient supply chain? To some extent, it's going to be a trade-off. It's going to be a trade-off because you remember, like um, Ray may remember this, we both are uh, in the management departments. We used to talk about single source supply because single source supply ensures that we, have, we don't have to do too many transactions. But then single source supply pretty much kills any resilience. So, so to some extent we are saying, okay, how do we build resiliency? Now we are showing, I mean, this is the data that is coming from Bain and company, resilience, in supply chain can not only give you that security, but it can also improve your revenue growth. I mean, the numbers that you are seeing, it's fundamentally there is an economic logic for making the trade-off, making the trade-off, and that's where we are we are moving towards. Friends, I mean, I, 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 I a lot of, I mean, I, I watched some of the, the books and the, the videos that come with the global security, I mean, global supply chain and the national security, a lot of the time we are talking about this uh, doom and gloom of the COVID and uh, the, the whole potential for the down and this, particularly the US-China issue has been a, a thorn in the discussion, right? But you have to recognize how much resilience we have had in the system, right? Now here is, uh, uh, I'm not sure if this is clear on your screen. Uh, if you look at uh, how, much, how, how much we have been able to grow, this is, quarter to quarter, right? Uh, in the last 2020, first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter, right? We had, a, uh, globally, we had minus 15.9%. Uh, the you remember, you remember the January to March, one of the most difficult times. But then in the second quarter, the third quarter, we, we shot up 17.9. And in the third quarter, we are up 14.2. If you look at United States alone, we had a very tough time in the first two quarters minus five and minus 10% in terms of the global trade. But third quarter, we are picking up. In the fourth quarter, we are almost like 28.8%. So if you really put it together, we are now even shooting above the pre-pandemic -pre uh, stage now, right? In, Chinese, you know, in, in China's case, the first quarter was a miserable one, minus 41%. And you remember that the, the whole country was locked down, but then the second quarter onwards, they have picked it up. Right? And that's the resilience that you see in the system. Right? On the one end, you, we are depressed or we are worried about the type of shocks that comes in, but at the same time, you have to see the amount of resilience we have in the system. Right? This is in, in the different, uh, different sectors, quarter on quarter growth. I'm looking at the fourth quarter, right? Uh, the, last, uh, the last fourth quarter of uh, 2020, um, the, the transport and logistics has been, is recovering now about 9.7%. I mean, of course, uh, the previous year has been so bad. So anything, anything that you can do is better. In manufacturing, we have come up, uh, we, have, we have moved about 16%. In, 
in retail, just imagine retail, we have come up very much, very fast, the 34.2%. 34 and in technology, 17%, right? And that's the resilience that we have had in this, in the, in these, in, in our, in our uh, economy in the last, uh, in the last four quarters. In spite of COVID and stuff, the recovery has been fairly fast, right? Now, let me walk you through three different case studies. One is the, the whole food supply chain, how the, the food sup supply chain is under pressure, like, and to some extent we have, uh, Seen a lot of a uh, uh, lot of these pressures come 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 and go and and I just mentioned about the the whole uh, problem of the milk and uh, and the other what do you call the, the the problem of the milk and stuff and we have uh, now getting better uh, on this and uh, now uh, in the in the food food part imagine like uh, I don't know did you. Did you have, did any of you have any problem with uh, getting, I mean, none of us start. We did have some trouble for the first few days or first few months in getting the groceries. But our food supply has been phenomenally under pressure, but we have made it now through it, right? Now that going forward, how do we, how do we make sure that we can continue that part? And that's the challenge that we have. And how do we find new avenues for our agricultural product. And how do we find, I mean, think about it. I mean, when, when we had this US-China trade war, literally uh, the US farmers had to put a full stop to a lot of what they were harvesting. In fact, uh, the, the US government was almost ready to uh, pay them for, for their produce even without the sales, right? And, and that's something that we are looking at and saying, how do we build some resiliency in the food, food supply system? And then this is something that some of you may have heard, like, uh, let, let me play a short video and then I can, I can discuss this. Feeling the semiconductor squeeze for the stocks that could benefit from the scarcity of chips and whether you should look for opportunity in this space. Let's bring in Todd Gordon of tradinganalysis.com, Quinn Tatro of Jewel Financial. Quinn, first, your broader look on what this is telling us, this shortage of chips, uh, where we are at in the economic life cycle and the demand for technology products. Yeah, Seema, I think it tells us that all that you just mentioned strong. I mean, we're starting to see an economic rebound. We're seeing pent up demand. And that's very exciting. But unfortunately, many of these stocks have sort of priced that in, in our opinion. I mean, if you look at, for example, some of these semiconductor stocks, they have seen incredible moves just since November. Many of these names we really like, but again, at these valuations, at these levels, I think they're very stretched. Our favorite applied materials, now selling 20 times forward, still not all that expensive. We liked it a lot more at 12, but it's moved 60% in the last few months. So I think investors can kind of make note of this, kind of write these names down. And then during a corrective phase, this is where you want to look because the demand is strong and it will continue. Right. You think about it, uh, the General Motors, Ford, and pretty much every single manufacturer had to shut down some of the lines for multiple days because they didn't have the chips, right? Now imagine like uh, the sudden jump in, uh, in the demand for computers, like uh, we, we just talked about 50 million consumers starting their home offices, the, the demand for computers. And uh, imagine the Netflix and, and, and all the streaming services that have come up and the, the demand for gamers. And I mean, video gaming has like grown through this roof in this last uh, uh, 10 months. And all this demand in, in those, those areas has fundamentally uh, choked the supply chain for automotive, right? And, and that's, that's what we have seen uh, the, the choking down. And that in essence, has blocked our ability to to serve the to serve the automotive industry, right? So to a large extent, uh, this is this type of disruption you can't plan for, but at the same time, you you see the the effect of how do we uh, how do the supply chain can potentially have to to disrupt your own production lines and stuff, right? And finally, in the in the in the in the pharmaceutical structure, 
right, in the pharmaceutical uh, sector. Now, here is one where we have uh, a, a fundamentally big issue. Now, here is something that we can take care of. And when we think about health security, this becomes an important one. Now, I'm from India. And uh, in fact, if you are taking uh, Tylenol or any of those, uh, the uh, um, what do you call this typical uh, fever drugs or pain drugs, you are probably getting 90% probability that your tablet comes from India, right? And 90%, right? And, and, uh, and India does not have what we call as the active pharmaceutical ingredient, right? They, they basically mix the API or active pharmaceutical ingredient with all the rest of the stuff and package it in the capsule and ship it to you, right? And much of the API comes from Japan, sorry, China, right? Now, if you think about it, China produces about close to $500 billion of uh, pharmaceutical stuff, right? China outpaces United States in terms of the pharmaceutical production. And that's something that uh, we need to uh, take cognizance of. Of course, uh, the 1 billion, uh, 1 billion plus population in China has their own consumption. In fact, China has a very strong, what we call it the public health system that, that uh, provides the medical care and stuff. And, and that there is a domestic consumption, but there is also a, a huge export consumption. In fact, API, the active pharmaceutical ingredient for almost any of the generic medicine comes from China, right? And during the COVID, we have had stories about Hey, how do we, in fact, if you if you cannot get some of the antibiotics, you you are stuck. So some of these critical uh, um, tablets and critical medicines we won't be able to uh, deliver if in case there is a problem. And here is another um, case of uh, how much we, from I mean from China where it goes. From China we we do get about uh, twelve billion. The sense like fifty uh, percent of uh, what we consume comes from, um, I mean, 50% growth rate in terms of Chinese exports to the United States, right? And particularly in the pharmaceutical, if you think about pharmaceutical, you can think of chemicals or biologics, like right? mm -hmm. chemicals is the traditional, typical like Tylenol stuff. And whereas the biologic is the, the insulin, uh, insulin type, which is uh, predominantly built on molecular biology, right? And Many, much of the uh, Chinese uh, pharmaceutical is built on the bio, biologic. And that's a very complicated manufacturing one. And a lot of these, uh, a lot of these production are pretty much owned by US pharmaceutical companies. Like you have Eli Lilly, which is based in, in Indianapolis. In fact, uh, Lilly has about 20% of its scientists in, in, uh, in, in, in China, right? So there's, there's a fair amount of pharmaceutical investments in China. And this is one of the concerns that people have been talking about in terms of health security, right? So we see, I mean, there is, there is a potential issue. At the same time, there is also potential problem in resolutions that are coming up. We are building resilient systems and we are moving on. And what I want to touch in the next few, uh, few minutes is where does, where do we, uh, how do we see new opportunities, right? Now, if you remember in, uh, when, when the year started 2020, time had a beautiful cover, the end of globalization. The end of globalization, they literally had a global map uh, ripped off uh, and stuff. And, and basically the, the, the article went around uh, arguing, you know what, the, the trade parameters are coming down, international trade is coming down, international, what we call as foreign direct investment is coming down. The movement of goods is coming down. Capital flow is coming down. So the, this is now coming to an end of globalization. Of course, there was a lot of talk about trade barriers and there was a lot of talk about nationalism. I mean, you, we, we saw it in the United States, we saw it in Europe, we saw it in, in China. Right? But then what we don't see is fundamentally, the technology is changing the way supply chains move. Now imagine, what is digitalization doing to us? Like, 
uh, I mean, a lot of you have, I mean, you have tra tracked the world from on multiple decades. Now, what you are seeing now, think about what you're seeing in terms of Airbnb, Uber, or Apple, right? Now, think about Marriott Hotel. Marriott Hotel just celebrated its 100th anniversary, I mean, centennial year. And they had managed to enter 90 markets, 9 0, 90 markets over 100 years. Can you guess? Airbnb in nine years scaled 100 markets in nine years. What's the difference? Airbnb does not have any, any, any hotel. In fact, they, what they call, they own no real estate, right? In a sense, the, the, the whole uh, model has been like, you take, uh, you lend your home and you lend your, uh, you keep it, you keep it clean and you provide the services and all they provide is algorithms, right? Same thing like Uber, right? Uber is providing this 50 billion taxi service, 50 billion taxi service without any vehicles. I mean, now they're moving into the vehicles, but fundamentally the model is shifting towards what I call asset light mechanism, right? Now think about uh, what does it take uh, I mean, I don't know if you can see this. Uh, I have a glass in my hand. Now, typically if I want to set up uh, uh, a selling unit in another country, what I would have done is I would have gone, scouted a place and uh, foreign direct investment means I put a plant there and send my expatriates, build a plant and then pro uh, produce the product and send it out, right? Now think about a typical manufacturing, what is happening now? You have a, the whole glass can be digitized and I have a digital uh, data set and data set that data can be shipped to another country and I can get a partner in, in a, the third country or whichever country I want to go in and, and the partner invests in the assets. So in essence, we are creating a bundling of the competence or the knowledge that I have in the domestic market with the foreign physical assets of the of the foreign partner and we are able to drive. And that's what uh, we are saying. The digitalization is, is fundamentally shaping how we think about business. Now, if you're looking for product flow, if you're looking for investment flow, you're looking at the wrong direction. Because what you are seeing is there is um, the, the data movement. I mean, we are talking about, uh, uh, I mean, petabytes. I mean, we can't even put it into our comprehension per day how much of data is transferring between and across the world. And that's what is fundamentally shaping friends. I mean, what we see is digitalization is fundamental. I mean, we used to think about digital, I mean, think about internet. Think internet was, was, was easy to get information out, information out for our product. Now, even the fundamental product itself is being translated into uh, a digital, uh, digital or, or data, right? And that's what we are dealing with. And you have the whole spectrum. Now imagine uh, if you are a G, uh, you, are, you are sort of taking care of uh, uh, the engines. I mean, uh, air, aircraft engine uh, maintenance is a big money spinner for GE. And typically what they would do is they will, uh, every place United has or, or uh, any of their major customers have, they would have a, a service unit there and the service unit uh, person will be pretty much working hand to hand with the, with the, with the customer and making sure that any, any uh, preventive maintenance can be done or any, uh, what do you call it, in case breakdowns, they are quickly able to address, right? Now think about what is happening now. In essence, uh, there is a digital uh, data that is, uh, being, I mean, uh, there's a continuous monitoring of the engine and the data is directly shipped to the to a GE system. And from the location, wherever they are, they can basically tell the, the, the service provider, like let's say United, hey, your engine is uh, showing some signs, the data is not right, so we need to do some preventive maintenance. And the ability to monitor and provide the service without being co-located in the service. In a sense, they can read everything remote and they can provide the support. And that's what we are seeing. I and mean, this is just one example, right? And you can see in, in many of the large scale uh, machinery uh, maintenance and stuff, 
Now this is becoming increasingly what we call as the uh, internet of things that's taking over, right? And that fundamentally changes the dynamics of the supply chain, right? And, and that's where we are seeing like, uh, whatever I'm, I'm pushing this as the globalization 4.0, in a sense, you are seeing more and more of ability to localize the manufacturing, ability to localize the manufacturing and ability to transfer the design and knowledge across the country. It does create new risks, new risks in terms of uh, proprietary entire technology can be easily siphoned out and cybersecurity. I mean, you, you see this uh, news coming day in and day out. Uh, a lot of the digitalization is opening our own vulnerability for IP theft. And all these new, new challenges are coming in and that's the type of challenge we are going to see. Now, uh, as we see, we, we in fact, I think this is something I wanted to touch on. Uh, think about it, like when we have these disruptions in the supply chain, we can't even, uh, uh, by the time you understand what is going on and take action, it, it is, you, you, have, you have missed a lot of your time. Okay, let me let me just show this uh, short clip and then I can I'll come back to this. Uh, this is what we call the digital twin. Some of you may be familiar with that, and um, and it is getting more and more popular in the in the logistics area. This, this is something that is uh, changing the way we thought about supply chain. Like now for the vaccines, um, I think some of you may know this, they literally created the digital twin to simulate where we can, we are going to potentially uh, see the bottlenecks, right? Now, if you really think about it, the last, uh, over the last the six weeks since the vaccines were launched, we have pretty much like, now we are talking about 1.5 to 2 million vaccinations per day. And that's coming out because we are able to identify potential bottlenecks and, and address some of those things. So fundamentally digitalization is opening up ways to resolve, ways to open up. And some of the problems that we talk, we, we had in the food issues, the, the automobile issues. So we can better predict, right? Now, what, what happens with the digital twin is the use of artificial intelligence. Now we are talking about where, uh, uh, the most companies can predict to a level of 80 to 90 percent precision what their uh, potential bottlenecks are going to be. 80 to 90 percent. You still have uh, 10 percent, 10 to 20 percent uh, uh, unforeseen, unforeseeable one, but that's a lot better than thinking about 30 to 40 percent. So our, our risk is coming down as we think about digitalization. It does create its problem of uh, IP theft and issues, and that's where, where more and more uh, investment are, is being made by companies and by the government to come to it, right? And, and now we are seeing the, even in the, in the broader trade, we used to talk about tariff was our biggest factor in, in any of these uh, international uh, trade transactions. Now we are not, not just talking about trade, we are talking about trade 
facilitation, how do we move the, uh, how do we move information? For example, think about it. You can get uh, from uh, Shanghai to Los Angeles in about 12 to 15 days or something. But in order for you to transfer money from one country to another, it can take you about 30 days because bill of goods, all the, the documentation verification, it, it takes a lot of time, right? Now, what we are seeing is some of the blockchains and the new technology that is coming out is sort of making that, that what I call this uh, uh, series serial transactions very efficient. So that's where we are going to see much more and much better and much faster ability to to deal with the with deal with the, these types of uh, problems. I mean, I, I like this as a final thought. This was one of the Trade Shift magazine. It put it said, COVID is a test run. COVID is a test run, and, and there are much more worse things that are coming up coming up, and uh, perhaps the climate crisis. And some of you may have heard from your friends in Texas, the whole crisis. Un unleashed by some of these climate issues. And that's where I think uh, the, the global supply chain and the, uh, the, our ability to transfer some of our new innovations to address this issue. You know, if I, if I went back about 10 years in, in business school, supply chain was one of those uh, peripheral topic. Now it is becoming pretty much the core and the center. We are no longer talking about supply chain as a marginal stuff. It is a boardroom topic. It's an important issue that is coming up, and it not only affects our uh, the uh, the production and the uh, the revenue side. It fundamentally challenges the security. Security not only in terms of the military. It, it challenges our health security. It challenges our our food security. It challenges our economic security, and that's where we need more attention and more more work is needed. And let me stop here and then uh, open up for questions. Okay, Charles, thank you so much. That was uh, very fascinating. Uh, I have about 30 questions I'd like to ask you, but I, I'm gonna start with just one question then we'll, we'll let others ask. And especially given the um, digitalization that you talked about, is this kind of national discussion we're having about Buy American, is this a kind of chasing old ideas that we really need to be thinking about uh, a new way of uh, imagining our economy rather than worrying about uh, sort of producing products at home for security when in fact there are other things that are really driving our security issues. Yeah, I mean, you, you think about, great. Right, that's a very nice question. Uh, see, fundamentally, you think about why the, we are thinking about Buy American and uh, all this uh, stuff. Now, in the traditional system, when we thought about production, we thought about production and the labor cost was a big chunk of the labor cost, right? I mean, you, you, took it, you, you think about your automobile, 40% of your cost is labor cost. And when you're thinking 40% of, uh, if it is labor cost, then you take from uh, one country to another country, if the cost differential is 10 to one, and you imagine the, 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 the implication for your uh, profitability, right? And that's what was fundamentally moving the production to China and moving the production to Mexico and all that stuff. Now what I am, at least what we are envisioning is digitalization is going to fundamentally shift the, the, uh, the what I call the, uh, the mechanics of the cost. And that's going to make local production not only feasible, but also pro profitable, right? And then you're seeing the more of the, for example, in fact, uh, we just visited a, a company in New York, which is uh, uh, making uh, what you call the ski, un uh, ski units, uh, which is very well tailored, like the, the, the shirt that uh, the outerwear that you will have has multiple gadgetry built in. It sort of keeps the, what you call it, 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 it measures your pressure, it measures your, uh, the sweating and everything and auto automatically uh, adjusts some of the, the fiber features, and when you are done, you come back home, and uh, the, even the cleaning and, and uh, washing out is, is a different one. So, I think we are moving into a time where the more sophisticated manufacturing setup can be done in a more uh, efficient manner locally. It's not about 
by American because uh, the, the, the costs are different. The, the cost differential is not what is going to drive us, but the technology up, upside is what is going to make this equation different. Okay, great. And just as a reminder, if you have a question, uh, send them to Sue Tempero. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Sue and let her take over. And if Charles, if you could un, uh, turn your uh, screen share off. Thank you. Okay, great. Yes, I, I do have some, and, and thank you, Dr. Donaraj. That, that was, you gave us a, a lot to think about, and I'm sure that a lot of people have questions. I have one that what has been described is an um, unemotional flow of goods and payments from rich developed countries to low cost underdeveloped countries. How does the speakers suggest the USA, for example, financially support millions of people who are displaced from the workplace? Yeah, and, 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 and this is where, uh, Sue, the, the ability for us to provide for the population welfare is, is very strong. I mean, you have to look at that. There are, there are two dynamics that are going on in today's American economy. 2019, August, the Business Roundtable came up with a statement that it is not the shareholder alone, but the stakeholders that are equally important, right? Now we are seeing more and more CEOs coming up, making those statements. Now, what is fundamentally, I mean, they take the case of um, Pepsi. I mean, let me give a very, very real example. PepsiCo, when it start, started uh, thinking about international production, in fact, uh, the uh, Indra Nui was very clear, like how do we make sure that the people we are, uh, uh, we are in fact automation literally displaces the people as we automate, how do we create new opportunities for, for our Pepsi employees to work through? And Pepsi created a lot of the, what, what they called as entrepreneur program. In essence, employees of Pepsi were literally getting license for running some of the bottling plants, license for or mobility plants, right? Now it requires conscious effort of the business executives to, to make that difference, right? Now, the moment we think in terms of purely shareholder benefit, then you only look at the cost differential, right? And I just mentioned, I mean, it takes you only 15 cents to bring something from uh, China to here when you put it in the container. And that, uh, that sort of takes the whole uh, equations off the table, right? So fundamentally, how do we think about new way of thinking about manufacturing. And number two is, now uh, I can buy it, uh, 100 t-shirts for $5 and, and after two wear and I throw it out. In essence, we are creating an, an economy that is, that is hugely burdensome, but we don't think in terms of that circular economy, right? So when you really think about what is the cost that it takes to get rid of something that we consume and throw away, then there is a different different picture. I think what I am seeing is potentially you can't just alone take the globalization and 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 uh, and uh, try to understand. In fact, globalization 4.0 will fundamentally look at revaluation of our own values, and that will fundamentally give us a different uh, different uh, different paradigm to think through. Right? I mean, I'll tell you this one short uh, example, and I'll stop. Uh, Indianapolis, I don't know if some of you remember, Rolls-Royce used to have a casting plant in Indianapolis. And we had this one visit, uh, this is nine, 2000, uh, 2000, year, year 2000. And I remember sitting, standing in front of that casting machine. In fact, I am a mechanical engineer, and I worked in the shop floor for several years. And this is, I mean, you have to visualize this 55 year old man, uh, I mean, literally a uh, uh, high chair, he's sitting on that in front of that machine. The castings are coming from outside, uh, from, the, from the furnace. And all he does is he has two wire brushes that he debursts the casting and then the casting moves on. I mean, just imagine that, right? And this is the job he will do for eight hours, uh, literally. That's all he will do, right? And eventually, the, I mean, in 2002, Rolls Royce closed that uh, plant, right? And then I, in fact, I used that, in fact, I have that photograph and I used to post it in, to my students and I asked, whose fault was it? And the plant, casting plant moved to Mexico. Whose fault was it? Was it this worker's fault that he didn't automate or he didn't think about his own future or was it the, the management's fault, right? 
So you have to ask yourself, like, how do we bring that the notion of technology is here to stay, whether you can't resist that, water moves down the down the incline and technology will uh, take on take on a new new uh, grip in the in the economy. How do we prepare our, our people, our employees for that? And how do we take advantage of the opportunities leveraging technology? And that's where I think we are not doing enough. I have a question from Larry Tomino. Is there evidence that either China or the US made strategic decisions not to export critically needed items to the other country for punitive reasons or as a means of politically inspired aggression against the other country? I, I would not be privy but, to any of that. I would not be privy to any of that. But then what I have seen is China used this opportunity to play diplomacy, right? If you remember, I mean, I have my mask here. If you actually, if you can take your mask and look at it, it's it's all likely 50% for probability it was made in China, right? So uh, there was a huge um, push from China that uh, providing the medical staff. In fact, uh, China did a lot. You, you remember when it, uh, the Italy had its peak uh, problems, China sent a whole host of uh, emissaries to, to Italy to support and serve them, right? I'm not sure there is the whole notion of the, the virus originate in China and we had the, what I call the, all this uh, theories on uh, the, the intentional lab and stuff. But I think we have not seen evidence of it. And we have not seen evidence of uh, US in, uh, willingly holding back, right? What we, have, what we have done in the last few years is um, in fact, I, I had a slide on the uh, the electronics unit. One of the Chinese supplier, basically, we we found that we cannot. I mean, as Americans, we cannot uh, entertain that in our uh, telecommunications network uh, because the potential for, uh, for 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 what they call national intelligence reasons, right? So we know that it's one particular company. We are literally blacklisted. And we had, as United States, we have campaigned Europe to blacklist it. And that has been uh, the long side. I mean, that's one area where I have seen a conscious national strategy to hold back uh, a company, a Chinese company. Right? And in the last few, uh, few months, we have delisted some of the Chinese companies from the NASDAQ. And that is happening. And, and I think that is going to be the tension. I mean, US and China tension is not going to disappear. right? And, and, and my take, uh, Sue, this is more uh, my observation. I mean, I'm also fond of history. Uh, I, I look at United uh, States versus United Kingdom, go all the way back to the 1700s. And it's like, uh, we used to be one, well, I mean, um, almost like 10% of the UK's economy, right? Fast forward uh, 150 years, we are now about uh, uh, 10 times the, the UK economy, right? Now, unfortunately, Fast forward another 20 years, you are going to see United, uh, United States and China. China will be roughly about $100 trillion, trillion dollars, and we are going to be around $20 trillion. So that's, it is going to put phenomenal pressure on, on, the, on, on our system, and, and that's something we have to get prepared for. So are there others of you who have questions um, that you might have? Yes, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, yeah, um, this is Claire. And um, from the book, I was reading about uh, rare earth elements, which I never thought much about before, which is kind of weird because my father was a geologist. But um, <clears throat> I was um, reading in the book that um, it used to be that the United States was the only place that mined rare earth elements. And um, it was only in one place, Mountain Pass, California, which is in the Mojave Desert. And, um, and then China got in the business. And it's sort of like 80% China and 20% the US. But the US couldn't compete because of the uh, environmental aspect and the regulations and the pollution of the water uh, in that area. And um, so they shut the plant down in 2006 and they declared bankruptcy. And in 2014, China bought uh, 
the U.S. plant, and mm -hmm. I don't know what they're going to do with it. But um, you know, I just wondered: um, is there any place else? Is there any future in exploration um, of uh, more rare earth elements in other parts of the U.S.? Actually, that's, that's a great example, uh, Sue. Uh, to be a uh, in fact, I, I don't, I'm not able to remember that in the last two, three years, we have had some new developments on the rare earth. But, but think about it, like um, this is going to, I mean, uh, rare earth becomes the critical ingredient for any of the silicon, which means all our electronics industry is uh, dependent on this rare earth. And that's going to put a phenomenal pressure on the system, right? Now, let me take you a little bit, uh, most of you, have diamond rings on your on your fingers, right? And you think about diverse, like the, the South African company was a monopoly in diamond business. You remember those days, right? It was anything you thought about diamond, there was only one country you could think of South Africa, right? Until we started getting more and more uh, new mines in different other countries, including United States. And then we, we started getting the artificial diamonds, all these new technologies, basically uh, uh, brought that the, the diverse um, uh, monopoly down, right? So the rare earth is one of those biggest concerns. In fact, uh, when we talk about uh, electric, uh, electric vehicles, one of the ingredients for the electric vehicles is also that rare earth, right? So all these are uh, putting a, a pressure on it. Now, how do we plan for, I mean, this is where thinking, I mean, we need strategic thinking to sort of say, how do we uh, rethink our, our um, rethink our cost stuff. Like you're you're citing a great example. Like if we only go by purely on the cost differential, we are not going to be anywhere. Like right? so, this is where it is not. It is not just going to be a private company's affair. It has to be a private plus uh, government uh, issue. How do we, for example, if this is a strategic security issue for us, I mean, security issue, not in terms of the military, security in terms of the economic security or, or uh, uh, the, uh, the fundamental uh, human security, you talk about it. And you say, if that is the case, how do we, how do we think about cost? I mean, cost is, a, is an artifact. It's something we write down on the books. And you can write it down in, in any, any different forms. And this is where the, what we call the, the tax different, the, 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 the tax benefits and all this has to be rethought in terms of what is potentially beneficial. And I think this is where the governments and the company, the private, um, private industry has to work together to create that, that move. And the same things you, not only in rare materials, you have this in, in medical, you have it in food, you have it in, in, in multiple sectors, we are having this. So how do we rethink our, our, our costs so and so and cost and uh, profit margin and all that. So we need both the government and the private industry to move. Yes. Um, there was also an example uh, about uh, PPE. And, you know, uh, a year ago, we were suddenly um, low on masks uh, for hospitals. And there was a company in Texas, um, it was called Prestige Ameritech. Mm -hmm in Fort Worth and uh, um, they, they had to close down several lines because, uh, and this was several years ago, uh, because China was underselling by just a few cents and the hospitals were buying the Chinese masks. And then the owner, I mean, they're still in business, but uh, recently he's tried to uh, uh, get the US uh, government to, uh, give him a contract for six years, you know, he, he will hire 150 people if the U.S. would give him a, a contract for six years. And so far, uh, the U.S. hasn't done that. So I, I don't know, maybe with the new administration, um, they would do that. But he says, I, I can't um, hire 150 people and then have to lay them off when the pandemic is over. Mm -hmm. No, uh, no. You, 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 if, if you go and go back a few, uh, go back to the March, April of uh, this year, or like the last year, 2020. You remember we were all pushing for why are we not invoking the Military Production Act to get things done, right? And and if, if you remember, 
from the date the act was promulgated, it took about less than 20 days for Ford and GM to get into the production of ventilators, right? In fact, when they, uh, when, when in fact, uh, I, I remember discussing in April or May, you know what, Ford should be in the business of innovation, not in the business of automobiles, right? So we have a capacity to do, and what we are really deterred is our sense of uh, what we call the, um, the, the, how do we cost it, uh, cost it out, right? How do we cost it out? And if there is no, no good mechanism in our system to assess the strategic, uh, what you call the risk factor, we will not be able to apportion the right, right level of thing. And, and just imagine how much does it, what, what uh, I mean, if, they, if you remember, um, 3M started ramping up the production for the N95 masks, right? And they literally had to ramp it up uh, within a weekend and move it fast. And they were able to do it. Uh, in a sense, we can do it. In fact, less than a week's time, they literally uh, quadrupled the output. And then later they started creating multiple lines and, and stuff. Now, how do we make this assessment? Now, US government made a deliberate decision not to stock at one point in time because they thought this was like a, too much of a redundant stock that's not going to be uh, needed, right? Even though, I mean, see, this is what, this is the human psyche of us when something is a very low potential, or very low probability event, we don't think in terms of the potential value or the, the risk of that event. Because if you only think in terms of the, uh, what you call the probability of incidents, we lose the sight of, the damage that it will cost. And that's what we have learned now from COVID. And, and that's why I put the last slide uh, as you, COVID is uh, uh, what you call a dress rehearsal for us to recognize the, the huge uh, cost we have to bear if we are not ready for climate change. So, so Bruce Frank asks, who when they don't think they have a future storm the Capitol and try to overthrow the government uh, how do these people get money to live? This is a problem. These people are screwed. Will you recommend the US government support the development of a rare earth mining and refining capability to overcome? I have, yeah, sorry, I, I have a feeling it is coming. In fact, uh, you, are, you are prophetically making this statement because we can't afford not to invest because the huge electric vehicle industry is going to depend on rare earth. Right, so we have to find. In fact, I, I'm not sure on this. Uh, don't quote me. I think it, it was Alabama or somewhere where they did have some incidents of uh, discovery and stuff. So we have potential to expand on it. And like, well, like all these things, it is going to be an investment that that will demand uh, a different type of calculation. Yeah. Well, would you recommend that the U.S. government support the development of a rare earth industry? I would think so, but you, Bruce, what do you think about? What do you think about? I mean, if you are in a I risk think assessment, I think we yeah, have I, we don't have a choice because if you want to electrify everything by 2020 or 2030, zero footprint and all that, if you don't have a battery and what is, what is required for your battery supply, we are doomed. Right, and everything's gonna run on batteries in 10 years. Yeah. yeah. What about the other question Sue addressed? Uh, and I'm sorry to jump in, however, uh, um, for 30 years, I've driven from Indianapolis to Iowa, past Danville, Illinois, and I've seen it progressively get gutted. One plant after another closed down for technology reasons, but also for outsourcing reasons. The people who worked in these factories, I don't know what they're going to do next. I don't think they know what they're going to do next. Uh, should a company be, you talked about applying costs that perhaps aren't traditional costs, but there are distinct social costs. Should a company that closes the US factory and lays off these company, these per people who now have to collect unemployment, should they be charged the expense that the government now has incurred because of the unemployment it has to pay to these people. Yeah, Bruce, you are, you are touching on issues that are so 
so core to our uh, what we I, I mean, in fact the uh, uh, my own uh, article on globalization 4.0 i taught in temple university in philadelphia and it was in the heart of downtown and all i had to do was drive i didn't have to do too far 10 minutes to see one of the uh, uh, automobile manufacturer plant that was not in use and the plant, the whole, like this is about, I'm talking about 10 acres building and, and all this, it's like dilapidated and, and the holy uh, coming down structure. It's in the, like, it's not in the, uh, what do you call outskirts. It's like within about 10 minutes drive from the downtown, right? And so what to think about the way we have got used to thinking about cost is I'm done. I've got my, I mean, what do you call a sunk cost? I've got my uh, enough revenue, but if I have to modernize, it's going to, my return on investment is negative. So what am I going to do? I'm going to just cut it down and walk out because there is no penalty for that, right? I lived in Switzerland, uh, Bruce, and I, I used to drive around. I said, what is happening in Switzerland? I mean, the, if you think about Switzerland, it's the same technology trends. There's, there's, the, there's the whole host of the uh, curves they have come through. But every single town and county you go around, you, can, you, you cannot see a dilapidated building, period, right? So how do we rethink about our, our uh, investment and cost and returns? This is where we need to rethink. And, and, and that's where the stakeholder capitalism has to take place, right? Now, unfortunately, it gets brandished into what we call a socialism and then thrown away. But I think this is this is what I call responsible capitalism. If you're going to invest and, and shut down, you better take the cost. I mean, the circular economy in a sense. Now we are uh, think about it like uh, on an average, most of you uh, have at least two cell phones, if not four, right? And you will throw off uh, within uh, two years' time. And imagine like if we have 400 citizens having each one at least one plus, and we are going to throw off in, in two years. Imagine the electronic garbage we are creating, right? And who pays for it, right? Nobody. Uh, we all do by a polluted environment. Yeah. It's a social cost not put into the cost of the product. Yeah, and, and that's where we need to rethink and, and reframe because without the reframing, we cannot go back to normalcy. So Ray Montano says, is the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative a boon or a threat to the local global supply chain? Yeah, I'm, I'm not so sure where that will come through because now the even, even China and Australia are fighting back and forth. I think some of you are watching the relationship between China and Australia come, 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 come apart. Now, it was one of the ambitious scheme of uh, China to sort of get its uh, supremacy in, the, in that corridor. And uh, if you remember going back to the TPP, that was uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership was at least conceived to counter the, that, uh, the silk, lane, uh, silk lane traffic, but we have not gone through very far. So the TPP, uh, we, we shut it down and to some extent uh, uh, we have not uh, pursued. Now, so this is the one, I think as you think about global decisions, this is, a, this is what I call, um, it is a threat that is in, in front of us. Like, how do we deal with the, we have never seen a like of it, right? We only have seen how we have grown from somewhere, a small community of uh, pioneers landing in the country to a $15 trillion economy, we have seen that only the growth phase of it, our growth compared, I mean, compared, take, take the exam, I mean, since the post-war, we have literally shot through the roof and nobody to match us, right? Now we are going to, in our lifetime, we are going to see that in the next 10 years, another country taking over and, and going beyond us, not in the PPP measure, in absolute measure. So imagine when China crosses uh, the $20 trillion, how would we feel? So this is a, this is a, a what do you call, a, a, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, it, it, is a, it is a challenge. And, I, and that's where like, I think one of the, uh, I think whether uh, Tony, Tony Blinken, he put it like, it is one of those uh, challenge we have and we don't have an option, but to collaborate 
and make this work, make this work. So, so Carrie and Charlie Boswell say, don't we have to reimagine capitalism to be able to compete with the Chinese system? I mean, that, that's a fundamental uh, rethink. Um, I mean, uh, if, you, if you go back, uh, I think Reimagining Capitalism, it's one of the title of a book uh, Rebecca Henderson has uh, penned down. Actually, it is not a new thought. If you go back, this has been a persistent one. Like, if you think about uh, Medicare and Medicaid, like, imagine, imagine the world without Medicare and Medicaid today, right? And imagine that we in the United States did not have Medicare and Medicaid uh, until a, a point of time, right? So to me, like, how do we rethink? I mean, you, see, you, you put the words, uh, Sue, we need to reimagine. And that reimagining will cost something. Now, uh, for me, if, if you are, uh, I mean, for, for someone who is uh, in the high end bracket, it's going to be uh, demand some sacrifice. But without that, the country will not move forward. And you cannot have a country where 80% are facing day-to-day -day insecurity, whereas 20% will be able to uh, enjoy the benefits of all the growth. So I think at some point in time, we will pivot. And now I see a very strong movement within the business leaders that's taking up. I mean, you can see Pricewaterhouse, uh, Tim Ryan is leading the charge on on this whole uh, stakeholder capitalism. And we are seeing uh, even investment company, investment banking companies, JP Morgan and, and others following suite. So I, I'm, I'm positive that the leadership may come not from the government, but perhaps from the business community, from the business leaders. So uh, does anyone else have any other questions that they wanna ask? Um, I thought of something. Um, I, I was just thinking that maybe uh, our government needs to subsidize some manufacturing the way they subsidize agriculture mm -hmm. and to take the, to get the money from um, Walmart and Amazon, the billionaires who have flooded the market with Chinese goods, uh, make them pay to subsidize our uh, manufacturing so we can bring some of that back. Yeah, I mean, that is that that's that requires reimagining capitalism, right? And, uh, and to some extent, you think about it, like, uh, the American capitalists, uh, you take Bill Gates, for example, yeah, sure, you made all the money. Now he's thinking in terms of the philanthropic stuff. So how do we Perhaps we have to come up with a new way of thinking. Is even that right? We the only the the the, the generic process is let's tax and build. Could there be an alternative to come through? Could there be an alternative to come through? Because we also know that tax and build has an inherent inefficiency involved. So is there a potential possibility for building a uh, building a wider stuff? For example, like. Now we are seeing a lot more of tax incentives coming in. Can businesses get more responsible in taking care of the employees? I mean, uh, sorry to quote this $15 minimum wage. Uh, you saw that in, in California when they implemented, uh, Kroger's basically shut down three, plant, three of their shops, right? So suddenly that seems to be an issue. And, and this is where the pressure is coming like, how do we take a holistic, a societal approach to, to uh, some of these, what we call as uh, the, the right actions to take? And how do we rethink our cost? Our cost is an artifact. Cost is not an absolute uh, reality. It is, it is a construction of, uh, it's a social construction. So if that is clear, then we will have a lot more uh, ways to progress. Okay. Um, it's 8.30 now, a little past 8.30. Um, yeah. Might have time for one more question if somebody's got a pressing question. Uh, if not, anybody? Janet, you wanna say yeah. something? This one, there's one question from Bruce Frank. Here, Janet. Go ahead, yeah, not, no, not, not out. We uh, have, uh, yeah, I can read the question. Uh, the economic implications of 
I'll go Jen, ahead. Jen How does this? Bruce, do you want to ask it? No, Charles, yeah. we're going to let Janet ask please. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Charles. I'm Janet Harris. The uh, several years ago, we had an excellent presentation by Ambassador Shapiro talking about Venezuela. And um, from the latest I hear, it sounds like Russia has managed to get the uh, contract to manage the Venezuelan oil. How did how did we miss involvement in that? I mean, the, the, it was not so much that we missed. It was the machination of the Venezuelan government, right? Uh, I mean, Venezuela basically is treating United States as uh, pretty much uh, the, uh, I don't know what's the word to use, enemy of the state. So that has been a difficult one to live with. And I don't think it's, uh, I mean, we still have quite a, uh, quite a good uh, set of American interest in Venezuela, but but I think it was pretty much intentional to, to make United States uh, feel the punch or feel the pressure. Okay, Betty, you wanna take us out? Any other yeah, comments? If there are no other questions, uh, I but think that, thank you, Sue. Thank you, Sue, very much for moderating our questions this evening. This was an outstanding program. And I think that the quality of these questions really speaks to how outstanding this was. And I just, it's, we're so very pleased. We're very pleased that we could have you this evening, uh, Dr. Donna Rose. Thank you so much. Uh, I think it also leaves the question of <laughs> where do we go? Where do yeah. we go? You know, I, I, I'm sort of stupefied now, but I think COVID has, has done that. It's, we knew that we weren't just going to slide out of COVID and we were all going to go back to normal. No, this, uh, we, we just don't know what that new normal is going to be. This has been exciting. Thank you. We hope you come back again. Um, please join us next week. We will have, it's going to be very exciting. Uh, COVID has allows us to really bring in speak. Dr. Donna Raj just brought to us this evening from Colorado. This would have been possible to have this level of expertise with yeah. us. Uh, would you put your hat on for? Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so no, he's thank you. No, thank you. But, but Betty, let me leave with the. This is a series that you're going to explore so you can go on to more and more <laughs> of this series. But I want to tell you that we have a phenomenal capacity to. to to surge back, right? And I wanted to remember that because as much as we had gone down, we had come up, come back. And, and my, my tone today was to re uh, reassure you that the, the resilience in our uh, will and the power of our people and our systems is phenomenal. And that's what you will see as you think through it. There are hard challenges. There are tough questions we have to resolve. But I hope as you work through those, uh, one by one, you can sort of think about how we can use our reimagination re and the power of our own thinking and our resilience to bring us back. I, I think we can be a powerful, as powerful as we are, if not more powerful in the coming days. That's my talk. Thank you. It's, it's, Thank you. It's in that American spirit, isn't it? Next week, we have another speaker coming from far afield, coming from Alaska. It is the Alaskan former uh, Lieutenant Governor Reed Treadwell is going to talk about the fight over the melting Arctic. He has a fabulous background, which includes being chair of the US Arctic Research Commission under George uh, Bush and Barack Obama. So he's taken, he's very nonpartisan about this and that's another really critical area. It's melting as we speak, you won't wanna miss it. And we want you to join us again on March the 9th, which is a Tuesday, make sure that date is correct. If it's, it's gonna be an out of Tuesday, we will have Dr. Pierre Atlas talk about the Persian Gulf security. You might remember that he talked about a, a very similar security. I think it was in the Red Sea. Uh, this is an area of expertise for him. What we're doing is something special that evening. Uh, we do miss being with you. We miss having the opportunity that when these uh, programs are finished, we can sort of stand around and ask the speaker more questions and so forth. And, you know, um, the Zoom ends, it ends. We say goodbye. That evening, we're going to do a nightcap session. This is brought up by the committee 
committee, Claire Collins brought this fabulous idea. We thought this would be fun. We hope you think so too. We're going to say goodbye to those people who'd like to, but for those who'd like to stay on, grab a glass of whatever you'd like. I'll probably grab a glass of wine, we'll come back and we'll carry on for another good 30 or 45 minutes. Um, and it, it won't be formal. The, there'll be not another speech. It'll just be a conversation, most likely about um, the Persian Gulf security or other issues we'd like to talk about. That's what makes this engagement with us fun. Please come back. Please consider membership. We want you to be a part of our, our membership family. Um, and so we will see you next week. Thank you all for coming again to another fabulous program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.